All right, all right. It says we are live. Hello, hello, people. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. I am here with Q, Quentin, Q Gilkey, the man of the hour. In oh. case you don't know him, that's silly because you should have just watched a live premiere of a video with Q, but I'm going to sing his praises anyway. He has worked with a tremendous number of big hip hop artists, longtime engineer for Dr. Dre, uh, worked with uh, Anderson Pack, The Game, Eminem, uh, a whole bunch more. And he, uh, we, we've just heard a track from Jack Newsom. So if you are not familiar, Jack Newsom, pop artist he was doing a track on. So Q, who's been known for so long working on so many hip hop records, has just done a pop mix for us. And it was like a Swiss watch of a production in a mix. It was so well put together. The song is like three minutes long, but it feels like it's over in 90 seconds because it's so tight, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. So this is interesting. I just want to start off with my uh, first question. Before I do, big thanks to Waves, who was able to make this presentation totally free of the public. We're able to make MixCon free of the public because of our sponsors. So Waves is sponsoring this one. We saw a bunch of Waves plugins all over the place. I want to ask you about a few of them. I saw the CLA Mix Hub a ton. I saw the MV2 a ton. I saw the Center plugin, a whole bunch of other things. And I have a lot of great questions saved from our live presentation. Um, before I get into my first audio question, the question I have to ask is, how is it like being a dad? You're, you've had a, you have like a week old kid at home, right? I do, I do. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's chaos around here, but it's organized chaos, as we like to say. So, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. You know, I, can, I wouldn't change anything for the world. It's just busy. That's all. You know, what can I say? <laughs> I hear you. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, because he's a new dad, we want to be really respectful of this time. We're just going to have 30 minutes here with Q. So we'll be ending this one around uh, 435 Eastern time. So keep your questions coming in and we'll ask uh, as many of them as we can. Uh, my first big question was, what may inspired you to come from this background of all these hip hop records to have your first mix for MixCon be a pop mix. And is this something you're trying to do more of? Were you secretly doing other genres, but the most notable stuff was hip hop? Or were you purposefully trying to expand more recently? I think um, a lot of people may expect me to do hip hop uh, because of my background and the, the artists that I've worked with. Yeah. Um, and this, when it comes to mixing, I think you have to, as a mixer, you approach it as a, a music fan, right? Um, and then after that, it's, it's, it becomes a little bit more technical. Um, but for me, I came up with jazz and classical music um, and hip hop came later, you know. So for me, it, it's just what does it feel like? How does the mix feel to you? You know, what can you do to enhance? And then from there, it's just like make the song as best as it can possibly be, whether it's country, pop hip hop, you know, for me, it doesn't matter. But the reason I chose that was because what I said at the beginning was people probably expect me to do hip hop. And I wanted to bring something different to the table. Yeah, good stuff, man. Well, it was uh, expert mix. No one would have been able to tell that it wasn't the genre you worked in primarily for so much of your career, because again, beautifully well executed. And part of that, of course, is your mixing. And part of that, of course, is some of the beautiful arranging that went on here. And we have some questions about uh, both um, what was going on in the session and how you approached it. We have questions coming right now in the live feed, but I've saved some questions from the premiere of the masterclass that I want to prioritize because they came in from people while they were watching it. And uh, one of the first ones I wanted to ask, this one is a little bit less about your mixing and about just the tracks you got to work with. Andrew Smolin asks, those guitars there, they were amazing. How many guitars were there? He feels like it must have been four guitars. He wasn't sure if they were live or VST. And he's wondering if it was a lot of different um, performances kind of edited and chopped together. Do you have any insights into what went on on the production side of the guitars before it even hit your desk for mixing? Yeah, so I did, I mean, shouts out to Jack Newsom one for allowing me to use this record and um, show the world, you know, what we're doing here. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the production side of things, they're just incredible over there with Jack. And so, um, you know, every track was different. We did this whole EP with him and every track had a little more guitar, some had less, uh, but I have, a, I know a lot of them were live. So everything like was recorded live and then probably like looped down, right? in certain aspects. So, you know, you're dealing with, you, you get these stems from the production side and they have altered them slightly, made them like the best that they wanted, right? And then they're like, okay, let's just hand this off. Um, and then I try to again enhance from there. 
but I, I don't know if, I don't think it was this record, but one of the records came in and the, the guitars were a little more raw. So they took a little bit more treatment, right? As opposed to this one that didn't take as much, but it still needed something to like kind of help mold it in to the record that it is and that we hear today. Yeah. Now, another question on this idea of having some stems uh, to work with. I mean, one of the things that was notable here is you didn't try to reinvent everything. Like you're really comfortable to say they did a great job on some of these vocal effects. I don't need to reinvent it. I'm mm -hmm. going to be strategic in finding the things that I want to highlight and bring out. And Wayne asked a question about, um, Wayne Hill asked a question about working with stems. He said that the stems were sent to you as well as a reference track, you know, according to your comments here. Mm -hmm. Do you start, like, how do you start and figure out what you're going to use dry, what you're going to use stems? Are you bringing it up with no plugins on it, totally dry, and then adding in stems? Or how do you make those decisions about where to go back to dry and where to use stems? So usually when it comes to stems, what I see the most when it comes to dry and wet stems is the, um, the vocals. So a producer will send dry stems of vocals and dry stems uh, or wet stems of vocals. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of my job to decide how I want to approach that given the reference that I have. And I mm -hmm. felt, and again, this is like 99% of the time I'm using the dry stems, but for some reason in this record, whatever they did on those vocals, I really liked. And I just yeah. wanted to maintain it because I feel like I could go in and try to, you know, recreate it, make it equally as good, or hopefully, hopefully, hopefully make it better. But I felt like through EQ and compression because it wasn't overdone that I could um, simply just enhance from there. Right. Cool. Let's uh, keep on going. Dr. Bolab asks, um, how often do you influence the artist's creative direction in the, as a mix engineer, I guess is the question he's asking. So how much creative license do you get from them? How do you know, how far you can push things away from the rough. I know you're using the rough as a, a template for, you know, comparing and make sure you're capturing the spirit of it. But uh, Dr. Boleb asks, do you have like, get creative license from artists or how, how do you know how much creative license you have on a particular yeah. track? I think it's on a, I think it's on a case to case basis. Um, and so specifically with this record and this whole EP, um, Jack and I would be on the phone and we'd just be talking back and forth or texting or whatever. And he'd say, you know what, I've, I kind of want it to feel like this. And I'm, I'm like, okay, well, I can approach it that way, but I also feel creatively like maybe this could work as well. And then we can still um, um, take care of your notes as well and hopefully run parallel in what I'm feeling and what you're feeling to achieve a common goal. And I think that's that was very telling throughout the whole record. Like once we built our relationship after that first one or two songs, it was just like, we just would call each other and talk and figure mm -hmm. it out. Right. So yeah. it case to case basis, some artists, you're never going to get to do that. Right. You're going to send right. your record in and then that's, they'll send you maybe a, a round of notes back and that's it. You know, you never even communicate really beyond that. So it, it just, it just depends. Right. Uh, Wayne Hill has another question on this general theme, um, which is how are you selected to do the mix? So how did you end up working with Jack and how many mix revisions did you end up submitting before the mix was approved? Hmm. So, you know, as mixers, I feel like you kind of have to, you, yes, you obviously have your name that you've built for yourself, right? And, or your building, but I also feel like relationships in the, within the labels are very, very important. Um, and it may not even be labels, right? It could just be, whomever is connected to artists that maybe you're interested in. So for me, I was, I knew uh, Jack's team and it was just like, we were all family. So I just, I had to um, reach out to them and I said, Hey, I'm a big fan. I just would love to be a part of this. However, and it's like, Oh, your family, like, let's just do this. Let's make it work. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're just, you're, you just, you like an artist and you jump in the DM and say, Hey, I would love to be a part of your project. Like anything I can do to help, I would love to be a part of it. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's worked before. So I'm, I'm like, whatever works, you know? <laughs> right. And then uh, the second part of his question oh, was okay. revisions. Uh, is there yeah. a normal number back and forth? You remember how many revisions were required on this? And do you have a special way of handling revisions to minimize them and make them the most productive they can be? Yeah, the revisions, I think on this was no more than three times back and forth, um, again, across the whole album. 
on this specific song i don't really remember but how i handle them is you know i um from an engineering standpoint they each have version numbers so that you know my mix my rough mix that goes out when well, i wouldn't say my rough mix i'll just say like my first take of it my first run of it um is 1.0 and you know from there just 1.1 1.2 1.3 um and that's it and that's it so sometimes they'll say i like the vibe of the guitars in 1.1 but i love the vocals in 1.3 so i always know in my pro tool sessions i can go back and import those guitars into 1.3 and just simply level it out and i know i have the reverbs and whatever i may have been doing to it at that time brilliant yeah all right. Uh, Pale Criminal asks, you mentioned not over compressing and it seems like you're using saturation as a way to soften transients. Is this more for loudness or more for creative effect? And how do you approach using saturation instead of or in addition to things like compressors and limiters? When I was taught to mix, um, well, yes, you, you kind of taught it at the same time. It's like a feeling and you know you have to like learn things on your own. You're, you self teach yourself a lot as well. But when I was around mentors of mine, uh, what I learned early on was that if you start to compress more and more, you're not mixing for the master. And, I, and mm. again, this is like very it's subjective. Like it's, it's all like everyone's gonna have a different opinion about this. But for me, I like to mix for the master. So I don't, I never want to over compress. I just want to make sure things are like, there's dynamic range to it, but also everything is level, right? So I want the quiet parts to be quiet. I want the loud parts to be loud. And then when the mastering engineer comes in and like does his compression to it to bring it louder and limiting to it, I, I never want to, I, I need to leave space for that is basically how I approach it. And that's the best way I can kind of explain it without like sitting and showing, you know, every sure. single little thing about it. But it, again, yes, yeah, saturation, all that stuff is like an effect that I simply kind of feel and I go for. But in my head, in the overall picture, I'm like, don't over compress things. Let the transients mm -hmm. live where they are and just mold the project and the session together. Cool. All right, just a few more questions uh, that came in during the live stream that I want to ask, and then we'll, we'll go over to the new questions that are coming in during this live Q&A. Um, so during the premiere, I thought this was an interesting one, Wayne Hill, again, he asks, Q, as you were listening to the reference, were you pre-mixing the song in your head before you even got to your gear? Oh, oh, definitely. <laughs> and when, when, you, um, when, I, when you say mix, like how I interpret that is, um, if I'm listening to the reference, I'm looking for those pieces that are the main elements, right? Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. is driving this mix? What are they trying to highlight? And what um, stands out the most, right? What do mm -hmm. I continually hear every time I listen to it? And what do I end up singing after I listen to it? And so mm -hmm. those things like really stand, I try to pick out of the, of the reference and that's where I start. So mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense, yes, I'm mixing while listening. Cool. Uh, this is an interesting one, and I wonder if it's going to be easy to give a detailed answer to it, but it's a cool question anyway. Uh, Pale Criminal, again, he asks, on a lot of your drums, if not all of them on this one, they seem to have a lot of boost in the 1K to 4K range. How do you find a good balance between boosting drums in that range and not fighting with vocals and other kind of acoustic and real instruments? That is a tough one. Um, it, it is tough. So, you know, for me... I like to like see sound. So I probably mix primarily with like with my eyes closed. So I'm, I make a little adjustment, close my eyes and listen to it because I like to shut off at least one of my senses to like try to focus more. And I feel like I can hear better. This is sounds so crazy even saying it, but I feel like I can hear better with my eyes closed. So for me, I like to visualize, um, uh, I think I mentioned this actually, the, the amphitheater, right? It has height, width and depth. Yes. And so, if I can still hear that vocal right where I want it to be and have the drums sitting around it, um, above it, underneath it, the, the frequencies don't matter to me at that point, right? Because they're working. They're working for what I'm feeling. And if I get a note back that says, hey, this frequency seems weird or like there's a weird thing going on with the drums, and then you, really, you, you, know, you dive into it then a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And another question, I think, in a kind of similar vein, that is one of those ones that's maybe hard to answer precisely, but you can give us a feel at least. CJ mm -hmm. asks, how do you know when you have the volume balance between instruments right? 
I've noticed that one instrument too loud can seem to affect width, depth, punch, any tips and tricks for what you listen for to make sure that the balances are sitting properly. Mm, that is, that's a good one. Um, I think for me, first thing I think of is going back to those original sounds, what drives the, the, the record? What are the main melodies? What are the main instruments that you're looking for, right? And so if you can turn off everything else and still kind of feel this vibe that the record is going for, then I feel like you're in a good place. And then everything else should just be kind of, it should be there, but it shouldn't be highlights, right? So I think they all have to kind of interplay with each other, but at the same time, those main points have to be the driving factor of the record. I think that's probably the best way I can answer that. Sure. Yeah. Real quick question for me um, about automation. I noticed uh, towards the end when you were talking about some of the way you approach vocals, there was one particular you know vocal part or maybe it was a stem where you did a little bit of like a low end reduction for an early mm -hmm. verse section where mm -hmm. there was just too mm -hmm. much low end and brought it back in, in another section. Mm -hmm. We didn't see you go into detail on a lot of automation mm -hmm. that you did, but I noticed that there were a few spots here and there. Uh, what are the most likely elements for you to use automation on and does this happen early in your process or towards the end of your process, kind of automating things? Uh, it's usually um, during the end. Uh, it definitely is. And so, and I always, I, it's hard because I, sometimes I end up at my vocals, like I'll start them, let's, let's just shoot a number out and say, you know, 30% of like the way into the mix. And then I'll always revisit them, just like I'll always revisit the drums at the end. Right. Um, but and so that's kind of like where the automation really starts to happen. Um, in this particular record, you know, it just he if you were to solo the the lead and where I took that uh, that low end out in the beginning, it has that low end throughout. But once the song builds, you want it there. Mm -hmm. Right. So if there's nothing going on in the beginning, like you need it, it just helps it build in a sense. Right. You're mm -hmm. just taking that out just a little bit to where it feels like it does in the last hook, right? Mm -hmm. So the vo you're not necessarily hearing that low end, but you're feeling it in the last hook, whereas you're really noticing it in the first verse, you know? Right. All right. Another question here. We've had a, a few questions around gain staging, so I'll try to condense them kind of all into one. Uh, Dr. Bolab asked a question about uh, gain staging. X SXRG asked a question about gain staging. Let me ask his because I think it's kind of emblematic of the, this type of question. Uh, he asks, I noticed you don't rely on the limiter much. I guess that's to preserve dynamics. Mm. What's your process for gain staging? And is there a particular setting you use for metering to know that you're getting to the right ballpark for kind of level or loudness or gain staging your mm -hmm. plugins? I think overall, this is, let's work backwards, I think is probably the best way in this. Mm -hmm. So in the, at the end, I want somewhere between, um, this is me being kind of old school and taught old school that I want in the peaks, I want between negative three and like negative one because mm -hmm. I'm mixing to master, right? So I, I, I've seen mixers, like great Grammy Award women mixers that like blast it into the red and they're like, I don't hear it distorting. So let's just send it to mastering. I'm just mm -hmm. different in that. It, mm -hmm. That would drive me crazy. And I would be thinking about it all night long mm -hmm. if it went out to mastering. Um, so for me, it's like, I feel like, again, this is just a feeling that if, if there's headroom there, then the track will breathe a bit better. Mm -hmm. And so... I approach it from there. And so when I start, so moving to the beginning, when I'm like, say, starting with the kick, I'm really low in my, and there's a ton of headroom. And I'll just bring all the tracks down in the beginning equally so that they still match the reference, right? But I'll know right away that that kick is hitting at zero, right? And it's like, okay, everything's just too loud. Let's bring it down equally and start it at like negative 10 on the peaks. And then we'll just build from there. And if I have to bring everything down again, I will. But everything will come down equally. So the mix will never change. And it will always be, you know, what I'm working on. But the levels will be where I want them. And I'm always checking them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there are so many compliments for this track here. Uh, people just were really marveling at how well it was put together. Pale Criminal asks, do you regularly get tracks arranged, engineered as tightly as that one? And did that mix represent the typical amount of work, or plugins or work uh, that you'd be doing on a track? Or was this maybe less than the usual amount of like work that you had to do? Or what's the, the breakdown for you in, in your life like that? You know, 
it definitely varies. They are not all like that. Um, and you know, there's a reason I'm bald. Like I'm sometimes I'm sitting here like pulling my hair out. Like, how do I, how do I fix this? Mm -hmm. Um, and ultimately you figure it out, you know, it's just trial and error a lot of times. Uh, and sometimes it's just like getting up and walking away from it. But to the question, um, they're not all like that, you know, and I think it goes back to my engineering days and being a tracking engineer, recording engineer, like, you know how to quickly kind of like fix these things the best you can. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And fortunately, I'm usually mixing here by myself. So I, I have time to like dial these things in. Um, but you just you take it as it comes and you do you make it the best that you possibly can. Um, and sometimes you're going to get a lot of room noise and vocals and things you don't want and artifacts. And also, fortunately, there's a lot of plugins that can help in fixing these things these days, you know? Sure. So, yeah, you just have to, it's just patience and taking your time with things. But again, not everything comes perfectly produced or how, you know, mm -hmm. however you may envision it. Right. All right. Uh, keep on moving here. Uh, Luke Roberts, I see you have a question about runtime. I, I want to keep it to questions that are specific to Q here. We just have about 10 more minutes of his time left. So I'm just going to keep it to really specific questions for him. Um, here's a question from Alan Benjamin, who asks, with the BX Masterdisk and Ozo 9 at the end, would you consider this to be I'm not sure if he means the word, he says provisionally mastered. I'm not sure if you mean provisionally mm -hmm. or professionally. I guess I could yeah, imagine I I mean, either yeah. working, but you consider this mastered. Would you take off either or both of them if sending in for mastering? That's a really good question. Uh, yes, yes. So I will take off, if you look you know, at the video in Ozone, there's a lot of things going on, um, but I'll take off the maximizer. And so this mm -hmm. goes back to gain staging actually, because when I take that off, you don't want it to be in the red again. Like that, that ha if that goes off, that's where you're looking for that negative three to negative one in your peaks, right? And then um, if I put that on, that's where I'm driving it up. And I know that it's not gonna go over negative 0.1, right? I'm not, I know it's not gonna hit zero. And that's just how I am in my mastering. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, it's, I would never call myself a full mastering engineer. I just know how to get the levels up enough to where they can listen to it, right? And so they can go back and forth between things on iTunes or whatever they may be doing and still hear their record at a reasonable level, right? Um, but the, to the question, I do take the maximizer off, but everything prior to that has to be in the perfect level in the gain staging. And that's probably the only thing I take off. All right, good stuff. Um, Let's keep on seeing if we have a few more. Uh, SXRG, I think we already asked that one. Um, this is an interesting one. TGR Music Group, he asks, how do you make sure you get credited on a record? Have you ever had any issues with getting your credits to show up? And do you have any thoughts about uh, uh, credits and the like? Credits are tough uh, because you can easily get left out of them. You know, it's like, I always think back to say like movies and film and it's like not to diminish any job, but, you know, down to the smallest level, like those people are getting credited for whatever they may be doing. Right. And mm -hmm. it's tough because as engineers, we don't always get the credits that we on things we've worked on. Um, and so, you know, you really just have to be diligent in it and stay on top of it. Um, make sure you're working with, you know, people that are going to look out for you. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a management team that really focuses on that. And I try to focus on it too. I try to work with people that I know and trust. Um, and ultimately your name is everything. That's all you really have. That's what gets people in the door. And that's what get you, that's what gets you in the door, excuse me. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's a tough thing, but you just have to stay on top of it. And that's all I can really advise. Uh, because you know, ultimately we're not being credited as much as we probably should be. And that, hopefully that, that begins to change. Right. Sophie Wynn asks, there's incredible improvement from the reference track to the finished project on this one. So that's awesome to hear. She asks, what are your top tips to anyone wanting to make quality mixes in hip hop? So I know we did a deep dive on pop today, but mm. are there, you know, one to three top tips of advice that you would give to people who are looking to perfect hip hop mixes? Oh, hip hop mixes, you know, it's, it's drums and vocals, you know, like, mm -hmm. and then there's like a melody line and like that thing should be singable. 
outside of the vocals, right? So you should be able to cut the vocals and then it just, just still have that feeling. Mm -hmm. So that main melody line is like huge. And the drums, you know, when I was, when I worked with Dre, he always would say, you get through your mix and you revisit the drums and you finish there. So like, make sure the drums are always uh, a major part of it. I won't say at the forefront, but just like a major part of your hip hop record. Yeah. All right. Uh, a couple more questions here. Let me see. Um, uh, I think you answer that one. Do you bring the stems down in level? I think you answer that one. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, here's uh, I just lost the one I wanted to ask. Hold on just a second. Um, aha. L.A. Winter. He asks what we saw a lot of MV2 on this track. What mm -hmm. types of instruments and situations do you reach for the MV2 on? Always on vocals mm -hmm. and most times on bass elements. Can you describe uh, what it does for you and what you're looking for out of it? Yeah, I'm looking to, okay, so usually it's, it's more important about what comes before it. Mm -hmm. So usually I'm trying to, especially let's just talk about bass. Like what I'm trying to do is either create, um, harmonics or like um, bring out the ones that are already there. So I'll use a plugin prior to the MV2 to, to do one of those things. And then when I bring in the MV2, it's to mainly boost that low level, right? And bring back all those harmonics. So if I, if I put an Apex Vintage Exciter, I'm looking to just excite the harmonics that are there and then once those are excited, I can bring up the low end and bring them up equally. And it's like kind of a saturation, kind of a compression that's happening strictly to the low end. And so that also happens in the vocals, but a lot of that's more saturation um, and bringing up again, balancing out the low end a little bit, that low mid in a vocal. It just fattens things up in some way. Cool stuff. Yeah. All right. We just have a few more minutes here left with Q. So really appreciate you taking the time. I'm going to see if we can do a quick little um, uh, lightning round here of the last few interesting questions. Okay. Uh, one user here, I'm suddenly home is the screen name, asks monitor speakers, do you have multiple sets, any single driver monitors, watch you like to listen on? And then piggybacking on that, Mike and Mandy Music asks, do you test your mix on iPhone speaker in addition to monitors or headphones, earbuds, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I only use um, the PMC 226s mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that. And I just, mm -hmm. I don't like a lot of, it, I get confused. It just confuses me because the biggest thing is that I, no one else has these speakers, right? Well, the consumers don't have these speakers and that's what, I, what where they're li listening to their music, right? They're listening on beats. They're listening on AirPods. They're listening in their car. And so those are the things that like, I really listen to. So I get the mix to a spot and then I just pop those in, excuse me, listen, or I put them on a beach pill, listen to that speaker, walk around the house. I play it on my Sonos. Um, and I also play it in my car because I consume a lot of music in my car and I want to make sure that nothing stands out. All right. And, and if it does, it, I come back in and I fix it. All right. Good stuff. Let me see if I can find uh, one or two more before we let you go. I think we're mm -hmm. just about at time here. So let me see if I can find a last great question. Okay. Um, I think they're pretty much set here. I think you already answered the question about, um, just to clarify though, um, mm -hmm. Mike and Manny Music is asking, with the plugins on the Master Bus, you're mixing through them. And when you mm -hmm. take them off, if I remember correctly, you're really only taking off the maximizer, but you're leaving on other things such mm -hmm. as the master desk. That was the answer to that one? That's correct. But those things are like a part of the mix. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hard because if you were to take them off, the mix sounds like it just doesn't sound the same. I don't know how to explain yep. It's like the glue, right? It's yep. the glue to everything that I've mixed prior to getting to that bus. Um, and I don't turn that on until, you know, Maybe I'm 60, 70, 80% through the mix and not start turning those things on, check a few levels, mess with some EQs, turn the next one on, do some work on what I'm hearing, you know? All right. In the 60 seconds that we have left, 
mm -hmm. the shortest answer possible to this question. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Bolab asks, you know, we got to see you really keeping the vocal stems in this case, but when mm -hmm. you don't have uh, really excellent vocal stems to work yeah. on, you're working from dry vocals, how do you approach vocal stack mixing? When you have multiple vocals going together, do you have particular rules about how to pan them or how you want to make background stand out from a lead vocal? I'm sure it depends track track but do you have any general guidelines on mixing big vocal stacks yeah i do i do a lot of different subbing right so a lot of different oxes so the leads have their ox i may separate backgrounds into four different groups and have those go to each different ox i call them subs but ox um and so you know you you have to treat them slightly different some of them have more high end some of them they're more verby some you know but however but when there's a lot of stacks and backgrounds and things like that, I try to separate them with the subs as much as possible um, and treat them slightly different. Uh, and that gives me like a little more control over them. Even if they come out the same fader, it's just like I can do things in Pro Tools to them to where that one fader, I know I can bring all the backgrounds up and down. All right. Yeah. That should be the last question, but I, I just had one more person. This should be a short answer. Okay. This is one more person ask uh, to second a question from G who asks, when you use your SSL, are you yeah. outputting 32 channels to it and summing on the desk or using hardware inserts on 32 channels essentially mm. as analog plugins? Mm, that's interesting. No, so I'm, I'm printing the, the stereo mix back in the Pro Tools, right? So the board is kind of the summing mixers. They're not hardware inserts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. I was trying to be quick on that answer. Yeah, no, that was perfect. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, Q, thank you so much for your time. Big thanks to you. Big thanks to Jack Newsom uh, for mm -hmm. providing that track. I uh, really thrilled. Uh, it was just so well put together and your mix on was awesome. Big thanks to Waves, uh, Waves sponsoring this one. If you want to check out anything they make for free, you can do that over at waves.com. Uh, they've got a sales going on this week as they seem to have every week. So definitely check out this stuff. I'd say the most common plugins there were the uh, MV2 I saw a lot, the CLA Mix Hub I saw a lot, that center plugin he was using early on. So a lot of great stuff in there. Thank you guys. I hope we got to as many of your questions as we could. Uh, I'm sorry if there was a couple that we couldn't get to, but I uh, really appreciate the time. What's the best place if people want to find out more from you or potentially get in touch or follow what you're doing? What are the best places for people to kind of catch up with what you're doing? Probably Instagram. Uh, yeah, please. Like EQ by Q. Uh, please just, you know, hit me up anything. Like I, I try my best to respond to any and everything. Um, and, and there's like a link in the bio for, to get to my management for any booking, anything like that. So yeah, guys, please reach out. Good stuff. Thank you Instagram, so much for having EQ me. EQ by Q. Yeah, hit him there. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this one, Q. Really appreciate having you on. Yeah. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop for MixCon. Stay tuned. Next week, we got a presentation from Tom Holkenberg, aka Junkie XL, and a whole bunch more coming hot in the heels of this one. But I think this is an awesome way to kick it off. A great mix from a fabulous dude. And Q, we got to do it again sometime. Man, my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Q. Thank you, guys. All right, guys. All right, going to end it. And our stream is over. Q, thank you so much for your time.